There we go. Hmm. I love technology. As we begin our worship this morning, let's take a few moments to quiet our hearts and our minds and to uh, lift ourselves up to God. You can use the centering prayer that's in your bulletin. Uh, this morning we're going to pray, In you, Christ Jesus, I am glad. Well, of course, come before God in whatever way works best for you. Let's take a few moments. Friends, I'll invite you to rise in body or in spirit and join me in our opening praise this morning. <clears throat> Let us turn away from the noise and the confusion. From the, the confusion, confusion and the pressure, pressure of the world. <clears throat> Let us acknowledge God's presence with us. Let us appreciate God's love for us. We come to worship because we love God. We come to worship. Because we want to love God more. We come with open hearts to offer our worship. Let us worship God and be glad. Friends, the grace of God overflows for us through Christ Jesus, who came into the world to put flesh and blood, hands and feet, a face and a heart to the love of God for us, even in the midst of our brokenness and failings. So trusting in God's grace. Despite that brokenness and those failings, let us confess our sin with the prayer that's in your bulletin. O Lord, our God, you call us to proclaim the gospel, but we remain silent in the presence of evil and apathy, in the face of misinformation and fear-mongering. You call us to be reconciled to you and to one another, but too often we are content to live in separation and exclusion. You call us to seek the good of all, but we fail to resist the powers of oppression. You call us to fight pretensions and injustice, but we sit idly by, endangering the lives of people far and near. Forgive us, O Lord. Reconcile us to you by the power of your Holy Spirit, and give us the courage and strength to be reconciled to others. Let's take a moment for silent reflection and confession. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Beloveds, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are indeed forgiven. Alleluia and amen. Friends, I'll invite you to share the peace of Christ with one another from where you are this morning. <laughs> Way back in the corner.
you. Please pray with me. Holy God, living word, write your word on our hearts, our minds, our very spirits this morning. Help us to take it in and to understand it in the ways that glorify you. And God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> Scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Philippians. I'm going to start at the very beginning and read through chapter, or excuse me, verse 18. Listen for the word of God. From Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus, to all those in Philippi who are God's people in Christ Jesus, along with your supervisors and servants, may the grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I thank my God every time I mention you in my prayers. I'm thankful for you every time I pray, and it's always a prayer full of joy. I'm glad because of the way you have been my partners in the ministry of the gospel from the time you first believed until now. I'm sure about this. The one who started a good work in you will stay with you to complete the job by the day of Christ Jesus. I have good reason to think this way about all of you because I keep you in my heart. You are all my partners in God's grace, both during my time in prison and in the defense and support of the gospel. God is my witness that I feel affection for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. This is my prayer, that your love might become even more and more rich with knowledge and all kinds of insight. I pray this so that you will be able to decide what really matters, and so you will be sincere and blameless on the day of Christ. I pray that you will then be filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes from Jesus Christ in order to give glory and praise to God. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that the things that have happened to me have actually advanced the gospel. The whole Praetorian Guard and everyone else knows that I'm in prison for Christ. Most of the brothers and sisters have had more confidence through the Lord to speak the word boldly and bravely because of my jail time. Some certainly preach Christ with jealous and competitive motives, but others preach with good motives. They are motivated by love, because they know that I'm put here to give a defense of the gospel. The others preach, preach Christ because of their selfish ambition. They are insincere, hoping to cause me more pain while I'm in prison. What do I think about this? Just this. Since Christ is proclaimed in every possible way, whether from dishonest or true motives, I'm glad, and I'll continue to be glad. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. May it be a blessing to our hearts. For the last couple of weeks, we've been following Paul's travels through various parts of the Roman Empire as he set up churches and shared the good news of the gospel. Last week, we talked about how Paul ended up in Athens via Thessalonica and Berea. The week before that, we talked about Paul and Silas's imprisonment in Philippi. Today's scripture reading is a little like one of those scenes in a movie when they cut away from the plot, from all of the happenings, to one of the characters writing later about his or her reflections on those happenings. You know, writing a journal entry or writing a memoir or writing a letter to someone else. I sort of picture it like the 1987 classic film, 84 Charing Cross Road. Is anybody else familiar with that movie? Oh, y'all, I need to load you my DVD. So 84 Charing Cross Road is a movie with Anthony Hopkins and Anne Bancroft in it. Anne Bancroft is a woman who's living in New York City, and she's seeking out some particular out-of-print books. And so she writes to this bookshop that specializes in out-of-print books in London. Anthony Hopkins is one of the owners of this bookshop, and the two correspond back and forth via letters for decades and end up developing this really deep, really powerful friendship with one another. And the format of the whole movie is that there are scenes of Bancroft and Hopkins going about their normal lives in their cities across the ocean from each other with their families and their friends. But then those scenes are overlaid with sections of them speaking aloud their letters to each other. 
And that's sort of how I picture today's reading from Philippians. The book of Philippians is one of those letters that's written by Paul to a congregation that he has started elsewhere. You know, the book of 1st and 2nd Corinthians is Paul's letters to the churches in Corinth. The books of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians are Paul's letters to the churches in Thessalonica. The book of Philippians is Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. Yep, that same city in which Paul and Silas had been imprisoned. The city of the fortune-telling slave girl, the earthquake at the prison, and the prison guard who became a Christian along with his whole household. So before we dig further into this morning's text, I want to set the Philippian scene a little bit for you this morning. I wanted to read to you a couple of short excerpts from the introduction section of the Philippians commentary that I was looking at this week. Philippi was a fairly small city in the first century, about 10,000 inhabitants. Philippi had originally flourished because of gold mines nearby, but these had been worked out long before the first century. And the city was important mainly as an agricultural center, being situated on the edge of a fertile plain where grain and wine were produced. The fact that the city was a Roman colony gave its citizens great privileges, for they enjoyed considerable property and legal rights and were exempt from the taxes imposed on those without the citizen status. Citizens of the colony were also citizens of Rome, and the city's administration was modeled on Rome. When Paul came to Philippi, therefore, he would have found a sizable nucleus of Roman citizens, many of whom were Italian by birth, that's sort of the area that we're talking about, the area of modern-day Italy, who constituted the aristocracy of the city. He would have found Roman administration and disciple, discipline, as well as Roman culture. The official language was Latin. And the city was loyal to Rome, which meant, among other things, that the cult of the emperor would have been much in evidence. Now, the cult of the emperor was the Roman practice of worshiping the emperor, and by extension, the emperor's family, as divine. This was a practice that began with Julius Caesar. There is no archaeological evidence that's been found for a Jewish presence within the city of Philippi. Perhaps it was not sufficiently uh, commercially important to attract them. It's noticeable that Luke makes no reference to a synagogue, in Philippi at all. And to be sure, Paul discovered the place of prayer there, but apparently the only people gathered there were women, and the one with whom Paul speaks is not herself Jewish, but, God, but Paul calls her a God-fearing Gentile. So Paul's converts within the city of Philippi would have been entirely, or at least almost entirely, Gentile. So that gives us a little insight into who Paul was writing to, the people, the culture, the geographic nuances of Philippi. And there's a little bit of other pertinent information that we have to think about this morning. Many of Paul's other letters that made their way into the New Testament canon are letters that address a particular issue in that church that they were going through at the time. For example, the letter of Galatians is written by Paul to the churches in Galatia that had received other Jewish Christian missionaries who were preaching what Paul called a different gospel and were trying to force the practice of circumcision onto these new Christians. So Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia against this practice. The letter of 1 Thessalonians was written by Paul to the church in Thessalonica. Remember, Thessalonica is the city we read about last week where Paul and Silas were chased out because the Jews in the city were angry that Paul was welcoming all the Gentiles into this new Christian movement. So the purpose of the first Thessalonians is to encourage believers there to stay the course, to remain strong in their faith despite opposition and even outright hostility. The letter of Ephesians is a broad letter for multiple communities written by Paul about the importance of incorporating Gentiles into the community of faith. The, ephes the emphasis of Ephesians is unity and community. But the book of Philippians is different. There doesn't really seem to be any major issue that Paul feels the need to address in this letter that we started reading this morning. Throughout the book of Philippians, Paul touches on a few points of theological clarification and teaching, because he's Paul and that's what he does. 
He also spends a very short amount of time, one single verse toward the end, on mildly rebuking a couple of the local leaders that are having trouble getting along. But on the whole, the purpose of this particular letter from Paul seems to be holy and utterly joyful. Paul is expressing his encouragement for the Christians in Philippi and the work that they're doing. Paul is expressing his thanksgiving for his faith and the ways that their faith bolsters his own. And of course, Paul is expressing praise for the person and work of Jesus Christ. This was all summed up nicely by one of the scholars that I read this week. He said, the passage that opens the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Philippi is striking in its emotion and intimacy. It suggests a deep and potentially enduring relationship. The key theological themes are remembering, joy, and fellowship. Paul's remembering elicits thanksgiving. His joy is rooted in shared tribulation, and the longing for fellowship can only be fulfilled in Christ. So one of the main emphases throughout this passage that we read this morning is the concept of koinonia. Koinonia is a powerful concept throughout Paul's New Testament writings, and it's a powerful concept within the the mission and the worship and even the identity of the early church. The Reverend Dr. Catherine Shainer, who's an ordained ELCA minister and an associate professor of New Testament at uh, Wake Forest University School of Divinity, said, The koinonia in the ancient world is literally a partnership. And not just a, hey, we're all on the same team partnership. It's a partnership that is formalized, recognizable to the outside, and often with tangible goals. Oftentimes it is a share in a financial or another kind of large, valuable entity. Even in our world, whether it's a share in stock, or a share in a home, or a share in another kind of property, we make these partnerships all the time, right? I'm sure you can run through five of them in your head right now. But we rarely think of the ancient world as having such partnerships, particularly when the shares are shares in the gospel. How often do we think of our faith that way, as shares in the gospel, tangible partnerships? shares in the mission and work of Jesus Christ. But truly, that's what we're doing here this morning. That's what we do whenever we gather here, whether it's for worship, for fellowship, even for Christmas cookie sales or cleaning days, or for major milestones like the 150th that we're getting ready to celebrate in a couple of weeks here. We're gathering together because of the partnership that we find here. We're gathering together because of the partnership that we have formed here. A partnership that we form and reform and reform every single time we come together as a community of faith. We're gathering to regenerate our spirits and our minds with our shares in the gospel. The message of God's love for us and for the world, a love so big and so wide and so strong that it took Jesus to the cross, to the grave, and back again. Paul's words from our passage this morning said, This is my prayer, that your love might become even more and more rich with knowledge and all kinds of insight. I pray this so that you will be able to decide what really matters, and so you will be sincere and blameless on the day of Christ. I pray that you will then be filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes from Jesus Christ, in order to give glory and praise to God. And that Greek word for more rich is even more effusive than our translation this morning makes it sound. It's literally the word overflow. More than what is ordinary or necessary. Outstanding, abounding, above and beyond. And notice it's not your faith that Paul wants to see grow more rich, although that's certainly probably part of it. It's not your perfection. It's not your beauty or your wealth or your success or any of those other measures that society likes to uphold. Paul said, this is my prayer, that your love, your love, might become even more and more rich with knowledge and all kinds of insights. 
have to be honest with you, friends, I feel like this passage is such a passage for the times in which we are living right now. They are hard times. They are divisive times. They are angry and hateful times. People I know who have been longtime news hounds, who have always tried to keep up with the headlines and what's happening around the world, have stopped checking their news sources because of all the anger and fear and mistrust and disinformation and ugliness that is spilling out all over the place. It's making it just too dang hard for us to be good humans right now. And I get that. I don't know about you, but I feel a little bit like a prize fighter who's been in the ring too long and has taken too many hits. My spirit is aching. My mind and my soul feel a little battered and bruised. But even in the face of all that pain and brutality, I feel like I could stand up here and preach Paul's words directly to you this morning. And you're probably saying, why are you still talking then? But we won't go there. Because even nearly 2,000 years after they were written, they are still true. I thank my God every time I mention you in my prayers. I am thankful for all of you every time I pray, and it's a prayer full of joy. I'm glad because of the way you have been my partners in the ministry of the gospel from the time you first believed until now. I am sure about this. The one who started a good work in you will stay with you to complete the job by the day of Christ Jesus. I have good reason to think this way about all of you because I keep you in my heart. You are my partners in God's grace. Truly, friend, I do indeed thank God every time I mention you in prayer. I am thankful for you, for who you are, for what you do for me and for this congregation and for the love and work of God out in the world. And I am thankful for this community, all that it has been, all that it is, and all that I know it can be. With Paul, I am glad, and I continue to be glad. Alleluia and amen. Our hymn is number 839, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Jesus. 
Friends, we come to our time of prayer this morning. So let us pray together. Holy God, few of us who worship and serve you in this place today know the reality of persecution for our faith. But across the world, many of our siblings in Christ still suffer for openly practicing and proclaiming their faith. Those for whom faith is risky, yet who are still wholly faithful to you. And we pray for them, Holy One. We pray for an end to prejudice. We pray that your kingdom will come, bringing wholeness and healing, a realm of love and welcome where none are excluded but all are invited to a place of honor with you. And we pray for ourselves, God. May we who have the luxury of being open about our love for you seize every opportunity to live and share your love and your good news in word and in deed. May we support one another as we discern how you want us to serve you in our daily lives. Holy God, may we live in the freedom that your love bestows, recognizing both the power and the responsibility you give us to live for you in all of life. May we be faithful witnesses and faithful in prayer for all our siblings and for this world that you have created until your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. In hope and confidence, Holy One, we pray to you in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is number 305. Come sing, O church, in joy.
friends, for all the different ways that our offerings come to us. We want to pray to bless those offerings. So pray with me. Holy One, in our worship, in our witness, in our praise, and in our prayer, we freely give from the blessed abundance that you have given to us. Use this offering that we bring today and use us in the work of your kingdom for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We do have a number of announcements this morning, all. Um, the service for Linda Sorensen will be on Friday, June 10th at 11 o'clock in the morning. That is at Grand France and Vine in Rochester. There will be a visitation the night before, Thursday, uh, June 9th from 5 to 8, and then one hour prior to the service as well. Um, if you have any questions about that, let me know. Um, I will be out of the office. I will be down in Dubuque for doctorate work um, this week and into next week. Uh, Tammy Ryder will be here to lead worship with you next weekend, uh, Memorial Day weekend. Um, and because June 1st is the first Wednesday and I will not be back yet, we are moving the June session meeting to the second Wednesday of the month. So that is June 8th. Um, so no session next week. Um, coming up on June 5th is our Pentecost worship, and that will be our story sharing worship. I haven't had anybody talk to me yet, so I'm just going to call it an open mic story sharing worship and trust you all to be moved by the Holy Spirit. So think about it. <laughs> Allow the Holy Spirit to move you. <laughs> Um, let's see, other announcements this morning. Dorothy Day, uh, we, are, we are on the docket for serving dinner at the Dorothy Day House this coming Wednesday, June, uh, not June, excuse me, May 25th. Um, Janice, is there more that you <laughs> want to say? Talk to Janice. <laughs> I just how many, remembered yesterday after you had kind of mentioned it a couple weeks ago. So. How many helpers do you need? What kind of food do you need? We'll send it. Can't be pork. Yes, no pork. We'll send it out in an email. If you have any ideas, let me know. Yeah. And we can do something as easy as pizza. So if you can help out, talk to Janice. And like I said, I'll, I'll send it out in an email um, either today or tomorrow and make sure that it gets on everybody's radar. Are there any other announcements this morning? Just a reminder that if you are planning on making it for our 150th uh, celebration on July 10th, it would be helpful if we knew that for catering headcount purposes. Um, are there any other announcements that I'm missing? All right. Uh, I want to share a little reflection poem. I'm not really sure what it's called called Thank You. This comes from one of the worship resources that I use. Um, and it sounded like a pretty good charge this morning. So, this is from the Spill the Beans resource. Thank you. Two simple words that can mean nothing or everything. Words of flattery or genuine, genuine expression of love. Appreciation and gratefulness for what others have done for us. Shared with us. Journeyed with us. Thank you. Thank you for sharing my pain, sticking with me in difficult times, helping me overcome obstacles, standing by me through falsely imprisoned. Thank you. Thank you for your faith in me and in Christ. Thank you for your prayers and for your love that have sustained me and nurtured me in ways you will never understand. Thank you for staying the course living the gospel each day and proclaiming the truth of Christ and his kingdom. 
to you who spoke courageously and fearlessly, with good intent and loving hearts, and an honest sincerity, which honors the Christ we follow and proclaim, your work is work in which I rejoice. So let us rejoice together, for God is good, and to be praised. Friends, may the peace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever.